very special club. Uh, thank you for the Rennert family for putting together this fantastic International Relations Center. Thank you the Charney family for a wonderful reception last night and for this wonderful new center in Haifa. So I guess it's another incentive to go and visit Haifa these days, in addition to the fact that it's a beautiful city. Um, what I'll try to do, um, short and sweet, try to bring a couple of years of um, research and experience in the world of international trade, foreign investment, global markets, in academia, media, in business, and try to share with you a couple of thoughts about trade wars and the state of affairs with respect to this very interesting, timely, and controversial topic. And then I'll try to leave a lot of time um, for Q&A because I think there's so much talent and experience here in the room, so we should all benefit from, the, uh, from your presence. So unlike Star Wars, it's very hard to put picture and faces behind trade wars. Who are, who are the soldiers of trade wars? Who are the heroes? Who is fighting this war? I'm sure if you ask most people, they will tell you that when we think about trade wars, we think about Xi Jinping and the US president meeting once in a while, trying to solve the world problem through issues like tariffs and other things. But the reality is, and that's what I'll try to explain in the next couple of minutes, is that the world is not waiting for uh, no one. Basically, companies, executives, NGOs working very hard to make sure that the world of trade keeps going. We invest in each other, we trade with each other. However, and that's very important, that many things have changed since the whole trade war started. But as you can imagine, part of it is because of the war and part of it is because of just global economic trends and politics. Um, the heroes of the trade wars are people who are working very hard to make sure that the economic engine keeps going. For example, these are chief strategy officers of global companies telling their CEOs that we shouldn't wait for um, decisions on tariffs and we should, for example, move our supply chain to different jurisdictions. Or instead of trading with a nation, confronting trade tariffs, we should just buy a plant or invest in a foreign market. Or if you are in defense, for example, some of the nations mentioned this morning, they're big in defense, aerospace, satellite. Uh, many of these companies, they are very vulnerable and they don't want to get into this trade mess and, and as a result, they just buy plants and invest in foreign markets to go around the trade uh, war. So in the next couple of minutes, we're gonna explain why governments and companies pretty much work in parallel. I'll try to say a few words about globalization and trade wars, then a few words about what the recent negotiations, formal diplomacy and diplomacy behind the scene, what it means for business and politics, and then sovereign funds, a lot of work that I've done in the sovereign space working with sovereign funds and central banks, and then uh, Q&A. So as someone just said recently, we're not free in order to engage in trade, rather we engage in trade because we're free to do so. In other words, we don't have the luxury to, um, we don't have the luxury to give up on the trade machine because it's really, it's part of our life. It's our um, uh, human nature. We want to trade with our neighbors. And in fact, quite often we also trade with our enemies. Uh, the famous Davos forum just happened a few weeks ago. Um, I, was, uh, I was there and uh, every year they try to uh, ask their CEOs, what keeps you awake at night? What's your biggest concern? What's number one? What's number two? What's number three? And it's quite shocking that number one or two depends on this specific poll. The CEOs say that uh, a trade and investment uncertainty, policy uncertainty around trade and investment is still number one on their list. In other words, we have volatility in uh, global markets. We have volatility in the marketing and digital space. We, we are debating on the future of the big four, big five of tech, like the Googles of the world. And still, at the end of the day, when you ask CEOs of global companies, most of them tell you that they are very concerned about the uncertainty in the trade and investment space. And as a result of that, what I see, what we see, is basically two parallel universes. On one hand, we are waiting to see if Xi Jinping and the US administration will finally agree on how the future of US-China trade relations is gonna look like. 
But at the same time, companies, as I mentioned before, they move forward, they negotiate deals, they invest, they trade. How does it work in real life? So obviously, as a, uh, uh, part of the story is the fact that even if you look at the tariff from the, uh, of the last two years, the impact on the business community is very limited. It's very limited because in terms of numbers, the economy here is so big, and also in Asia and Europe, that the impact of tariff is very limited. Second, as I explained before, global companies are very nimble, very flexible. When they see that the reality is changing, they move to a di different market. I'll give you a few examples. And then finally, the impact is limited, again, because at the end of the day, the investors try to focus as a result on and in industries where the uh, impact of trade and trade barriers is relatively limited. What kind of reactions I see in the market when I say corporate flexibility, track to diplomacy, what companies do? I spent the, last couple, of, uh, uh, the uh, last couple of weeks of the summer, this past summer in Germany, doing a project with the US and German government, working on bilateral trade and investment policies, interviewing CEOs of German companies, uh, talking to heads of unions in Germany. And as you know well, Germany is, is a unique case study because on one hand, it has a lot of old industries like the car industry, but at the same time, Germany is really trying to be ahead of the game when it comes to the knowledge economy and the di digital space. At the same time, labor unions in Germany are very, very strong. So I always found the Germany story very interesting in that respect. Advanced manufacturing, the fact that they are not concerned like many US companies about losing jobs as a result of AI and the digital economy. So what do they tell me when it comes to um, the whole uh, trade barriers and protectionism in the, econ in the economic space? They say very straightforward. When we realize very quickly that the whole issue of, for example, tariffs on cars is going to hit very hard, and who knows if it's going to happen, we don't have the luxury to wait. We're going to negotiate track to diplomacy with other car companies, uh, suppliers, parts, um, other NGOs, the labor unions, to make sure that if something like that happens, we're very ready. As a result, for example, many German car manufacturers moved part of their supply chain to markets where they are less in, uh, uh, involved and less influenced by many US policies, especially in the trade space. Um, if you look at the last couple of years, in general, trade is in decline. What do I mean by that? Two very important things. One is, in general, and it's counterintuitive, we actually trade less with each other in the last couple of years. There is a great center here at the business school at NYU. They looked at what's called interconnectivity in politics, in diplomacy, in business, basically how much time we spend with each other. And if you look at the recent report from the last couple of years, you will realize that we actually, when you look at uh, certain parts of the economy, we trade less with each other. Why? Because of many things. Because of the knowledge economy, we can actually do more things remotely. And also geography in the economic protectionism space plays a huge role. So we always prefer to trade with our neighbors. That's, by the way, a reason why uh, certain countries surrounded by enemies or island economies like Singapore, it's always a challenge for them to adjust themselves to the changing economy. So that's one thing, we trade less. Secondly, the, um, the perception of what we think about trade actually changed a lot and way before the Trump era. So if you look at polls in America the last 40, 50 years, both Democrats and Republicans, actually, it's quite interesting, both political parties, over time, people believe less and less in trade. Now, of course, there are differences between Democrats and Republicans, but in general, as a result of the uh, consequences of globalization and internal political trends in America, in general, people, when they're asked about their perception of trade, there are less believers, uh, they, they believe less in trade in comparison to, for example, in the 50s or 60s. Why it's so important? Because one of the things that I, I, I hope that companies will do more is that instead of going to the media or to their boards or just in general to the public and say, you know, the world is black and white. Either we, we believe in globalization or we're anti-globalization. Whether we think that the future is global trade or the future is really localization of trade, I think it will be more important if they will spend more time, energy, and money on explaining the world what globalization actually is, what it means, and what are the, what's the relationship relationship between trade, investment, and globalization. So for example, if we see that both political parties in America, Republican and Democrats, actually agree, one of the few things they agree on is to find the right balance between national security and trade, that's why they passed 
legislation this past year to reform the review of trade and investment in America. It means to me that we as a society should focus on those areas where Republicans and Democrats come together, and that could be a great point where they can get involved both in terms of formal diplomacy and track to diplomacy. As I mentioned before, the Trump administration and Xi Jinping are working very hard to, find, to try to find a solution. But as I mentioned before, sometimes we don't know who are the heroes of the trade wars, who are actually the soldiers. And unlike many other heroic wars, this war is actually conducted by usually bureaucrats, officials, lawyers. It was just published a few days ago, for example, that the WTO, this important institution in Europe, just decided on a very interesting case where Russia decided to block transportation of trucks in Ukraine because they thought that, um, that if they let the Ukrainians move trucks around for energy and goods, it's actually part of the official war between Ukraine, part of Ukraine and Russia. So, and the WTO said that Russia can actually do that. It's not a violation of trade rules, which means that you have now global institutions, lawyers or institutions like the WTO that are way more important to global trade or what governments can actually do on trade and investment than the, uh, than the, um, the, the, the actual uh, political negotiators. And by the way, one of the things that are on the table as part of this arrangement is that the Chinese, for example, will buy more goods from the Americans. Who are these institutions that are going to buy more goods? These are probably state-owned companies and the kind of companies anyway that many of the U.S. companies don't deal with on a regular basis, which means that U.S. companies will continue and do business uh, 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 similar to the past. Now towards the end, I want to say two things. One is on foreign investment more generally and secondly about sovereign finance and sovereign wealth funds. Let's start with FDI, foreign direct investment. I, I'm a big believer in the world of unintended consequences. And I think it's, it's not a coincidence that so many interesting th things happened in the last couple of weeks and months as a result of the trade war, so to speak. Uh, we see a huge decline of Asian investment in the US market. Just this past year, 2018, there is a decline of 90%, 90% of Chinese money into the US economy. Now, if you are hawkish on national security, you're gonna say, wow, great. It means that now we, have, uh, now we can bring the Europeans, the Australians, the, uh, uh, some other parts of the US economy. The reality is that this vacuum of 90% Chinese and even more Asian uh, uh, money in general, it's not always being filled by other institutions. So the, the, the heritage of the US society and economy is that foreign investment is good for the US economy. It's a driver of growth for the US economy. So what actually happened around this decline in foreign investment in America? A couple of things, very quickly. First of all, the rise of private capital. So if you're in private equity, edge fund, those kind of vehicles, this is your uh, uh, golden age because, again, people believe less in uh, capital markets. By the way, among other things, they believe that capital markets are more uh, vulnerable when it comes to uh, trade barriers and economic protectionism. The second thing is what I call South-South investing. In other words, when US and China are fighting against each other, it's a great opportunity for emerging markets, South uh, countries, to actually trade and invest with each other. So in 2018, we saw a boom in what's called South South investing. Let's say a, a, a relatively poor country from Africa investing in emerging markets in Latin America or in Asia. We've never seen such a spike before. The third issue, uh, you see the drone on the screen, national security and commerce. 2017, 2018 was really the peak when it comes to discussion on how you find the right balance between national security and commerce. Now, since the 50s, or even before First World War, Second World War, Americans were always concerned about what it means to trade with the enemy. People were very suspicious about the Germans doing business with the Germans in the 40s. People were very suspicious about Japanese companies buying real estate and trophy assets in New York City in the 80s. Now we're 2019, nothing has changed. Maybe the identity of the buyer has changed, but the reality is that this discussion about how you find the right balance between national security and commerce, it's, it's uh, a very timely debate. The US administration, for example, as I mentioned before, found one way to do it. They changed the law last year. So if you are an energy company from Europe or Asia, it's gonna be very hard for you to buy a pipeline, a natural gas plant, uh, uh, you name it in America. And then finally, the, the whole world of um, foreign direct investment in general 
as a value for the American economy. So you have conferences, large, very important, like Select USA. It's a new uh, agency started a few years ago by the US administration to encourage global companies to come to the US market. Perfect case of track to diplomacy, company to company, company to the NGO or, uh, or, or another agency. The reality is that these kind of agency, ventures, group, they don't live in a vacuum. We live in a, in, in a, in a world where people read the, the media, listen to the media, and I think this whole uh, 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 debate on trade war, which, as I just tried to explain to you, is not always accurate and complete, it means that it's very hard to run uh, uh, this, uh, initi these initiatives. And then finally, I want to say a few words about sovereign finance, sovereign wealth funds. Um, when I started working with sovereign wealth funds, sovereign finance many years ago, it was a world of unknown. Nobody knew what it means. Uh, the first time that the American public actually heard the term sovereign finance or sovereign wealth funds, it was in 2006-7 uh, when Dubai Port, which was actually uh, a, a, a Middle East uh, entity through London tried to invest in ports in America. I don't know if you remember, Senator Schumer woke up one day and he said, how can it be that we actually let uh, an Arab entity buy our strategic ports? As a result, they changed the law. They made it a little bit harder to invest in strategic <coughs> assets like ports. Fast forward 2019, now it's even harder as a result of the reform last year. Just very briefly, how the world of sovereign funds has changed and why, why it's so relevant to today's discussion. The first fund in the world, 1953, it's Kuwait. That was the first time that a government decided to take energy resources and to create a vehicle investing in foreign markets. Fast forward 2006, as I just described to you, the Dubai port story, people didn't feel comfortable with sovereign government investing in private markets. Then 2008, the opposite happened. The financial crisis happened. Citibank was craving for money. Uh, JP Morgan was craving for money. Even we were craving for money. And as a result of this process, um, the sovereign funds were the savers of Wall Street, so to speak, and many of them became strategic investors in many of these banks. Why do I tell you that? Because from my perspective, 2008 was really the turning point when it comes to sovereigns, governments, state-owned companies, central banks' role in private markets. So if I look at the last 10 years, from 2008 to today, basically most of these entities, sovereign funds, governments, central banks, became legitimate institutional investors. So for example, Norway now, they have more than $1 trillion uh, under management. So universities are important, and, and banks are important. But could you imagine when you have a one single government that owns 1% of each company worldwide, and in fact they have more asset under management than so many companies on Wall Street? So when they say we have a, a, a committee on ethics and we will tell the world what kind of companies we can invest in and what kind of companies we cannot, it's not only the fact that the financial institution has values and ethics, it's also a sovereign government, i.e. Norway, tells the world how the world should look like. What I just said, it's, it's not a question of right or wrong, that's a model. Obviously, other governments decided to do it differently. So how the future going to look like? As I just said, sovereign funds, central banks, governments in general are becoming legitimate players in global markets. When they go to Davos, they're part of the Institutional Investors Forum. When they go to Wall Street, they compete uh, for specific investments. They compete against insurance companies, and they compete against pension funds and just other legitimate <coughs> US or European uh, uh, institutional investors. And the real question, and here I want to conclude, so how, how the future is going to look like in a world where basically sovereigns or governments interact with private markets in a very different way? It raises all types of interesting questions, from ethics to how you do business to economic models. I'll just conclude with one little example. Many of these sovereigns, for example, invest in environmentally friendly uh, ventures and startups because they say, why should we wait for the private sector to solve the problems? We actually can solve the problem ourselves by uh, investing through all these vehicles. So it can actually change the whole model of how we think about the role of government in private market, the role of private markets in government, and how we solve all the problems that we heard about this morning from HIV to AIDS to the environment to just making the world a better place. Thank you very much, and I would love to hear your questions. Uh, are you staying until the end of the day, right? Yeah. And most of the afternoon. All right, so uh, 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 we'll take maybe um, uh, 
a couple of questions because um, I really want to stay on time and properly introduce our next speaker. So let's uh, allow people that didn't get a chance to ask. Yes, please. Hi. First of all, it was very interesting. I, I have a question about you started by saying that the Indigo, the trade war now between the US and China, the business still continues and so forth. So I have two clients. One was buying raw materials from China. The other was buying gadgets and selling them. And when there was 10% uh, tariff, they just absorbed it. But they were really afraid when, if and when it's going to turn to 25%. So my question is, is pricing or is the tariff uh, a, a percentage would, would change, would have changed the, uh, or will, will change if something goes wrong? Let's take a couple yeah. of uh, very quick questions. I'll respond to all of them in less than two minutes, and then the next speaker will show up. Yeah. Okay. Yes, please, ma'am. Some ladies. Yes, you. Um, I know nothing about this. And so when you said China has, you know, reduced 90%, why then are we supposedly holding the cards? In other words, they seem to be controlling us. Okay. Uh, you mentioned about uh, free trade, either the absolute black or white. Uh, don't you think that the emphasis should be on fair trade than the free trade? Because if you, if you see, especially the United States, that's the, practically the United States has that's the best, almost every country. Mm -hmm. China about $500 billion, Mexico about $50 billion, with India about $45 billion. And um, at the same time, if you see anti-dumping cases, whether it's the United States or European Union, maximum cases are against China or India. Okay. Yes, please. So, I mean, it's just fascinating. Um, Thank you. I, I, I've heard this argument the exact opposite way, that it's private sector that is going to... Uh, I've heard this <coughs> argument the exact opposite way, uh, that private sector is what's going to <coughs> cause innovation and, um, and it, you know, help that along. And so it seems like you're saying, no, it's the individual governments are going to now have the... So government should get larger, I'm saying that. That's a great point. So I'll just respond and I'll take the... the oh. Maybe, maybe we, we can... Uh, Either you have a very aggressive crowd here. Right. Maybe we can. The question was um, that if in the past we were told that it's the private sector that will promote innovation and so on, now uh, Dr. Halamish is, uh, is presenting a different view that talks about the centrality of government in the private sector. Uh, so my suggestion, those of you who haven't, I know a few, a few more people would like to ask questions. Dr. Halamish is staying here, and you can ask him questions during the next break, okay? So let's move on to the next speaker, and please answer those questions. And then. Excellent, very briefly. Great point. So I think you're absolutely right. Eventually, it's going to be a hybrid approach. In other words, of course, private companies will continue to take the lead on many things, but and I, he I think this is the re revolution, that you have a whole different universe where you have sovereign entities uh, uh, really um, leading uh, with, when it comes to innovation and solving the world's problem. Just for, for, as an example, if you follow the news, most of the major tech investments in the last couple of years, from the Ubers of the world to more alternative medical visionary solutions to cancers, now usually it's a joint venture between a sovereign vehicle like the ones I just described to you and private markets. And I think this is really the future. And I think sometimes governments know better than private markets what are the problems and, 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 and how to solve them. With respect to your question, uh, um, Mr. Milch, about the uh, the uh, kind of the theories how the, you know that we see the world is changing in front of us absolutely if you talk to central bankers they will tell you that they they studied or they uh, uh, worked for 50 70 years and now they, they realize that kind of so to speak they run out of bullets in terms of their ability to respond to changing environments and i think the next two years is going to be um, uh, very interesting um, I, I want to respond to the other two questions, but I know that Ido really wants to start on time, and I see that it's 12 o'clock. So please forgive me, and I'll respond to the other remaining two questions in the break. Thank you very much.